Digest there, so I think we just have an answer to Richard's question, and then we go on to to Bill and Luke. Thanks very much for that, um, Richard. I I agree with you. I think that the, the more moralizing is the state aggressive universalism. I think Morgan Fowler would also agree with us on that one. Um, I was just thinking in terms of from what perspective you see this good governance debate. If you ask the Brazilians at the time, the whole responsibility to protect, for instance, was negotiated. They would tell you that this is precisely what it is. Um, this was, for, for a lot in the, of, of folks in member states in the global south, this was again another way for western style interventionism to be justified, but now it was in a shell in a different type of, a different type of discourse. Um, I also don't think in that sense that you know, the, the global governance, the good governance debate is such a bad thing and we do lots of, I do lots of work in, in, in these development circles as well, and at least there you, you, can, you, can, you might have the argument that a lot of people there mean well. Um, so there isn't, there isn't as much of the, the hidden kind of evil involved perhaps in that. But, but I think it again, it's in the eye of the beholder. If you, look at, if you look at Libya, where they tried or they did implement, funnily enough, it was the, the Arab League, it was Lebanon who tried to say to the, or did say to the Security Council, why don't we put R2P into the Libyan Security Council resolutions 1970 and 1973, where it then suddenly said, 
you know, the Libyan state has a responsibility to protect people in its territory. And since it wasn't doing that, then it also, here you have carte blanche and in a way now you can intervene. If you take that from the other perspective of the host state who suddenly finds, them, who suddenly find themselves confronted with such a discourse, um, you're almost again in the same basket. But, um, but I don't know whether that really, yeah, that, yeah, that answers your question. Um, I'll take it, yeah. and I will uh, continue. Okay, great. Um, maybe, yes, but uh, maybe not. Um, I, uh, great answer, hey. No, I think, uh, I mean, the difference that, uh, the problem that I have uh, at the moment with the European Union and why I don't mind, in a sense, labeling it as a crisis is that First of all, I think it is the most existential crisis that the, that, that the European Union has ever faced. I think it makes the empty chair crisis and the rebate debate look like nothing at all. Um, and what worries me the most is that, that everything that's being tried is, uh, so far, apart from a few things in this, the six-pack of commission um, uh, regulations that were proposed, is pushing at the wrong problem. It's, it's, it's all entirely addressed to... A, a false read. It's, it's addressed to solving a problem that doesn't exist, which is a problem of fiscal profligacy or overburdened, you know, huge welfare states or, you know, whatever, whatever it, it, you know, the narrative of the day is. It's all addressed to the wrong problems. And if, if the competitiveness gap, for instance, is to be closed in any way, um, economically speaking, there really isn't, if the, if the Eurozone is to stay together in its current form, for Greece to regain any kind of degree of competitiveness, it's just simple logic that Germany, the Netherlands, that they have to accept 4% inflation for the next 5 to 10 years. The adjustment will just take that long. If it's 4% in the, in the core, I really do hate this term. I just can't come up with a better one if anyone has a suggestion. The, nor the north, the south doesn't work because of you guys. You're, you're, you're not so much south in Ireland. Um, but uh, co core periphery, for the sake of just answering the question, 4% um, in the core and relatively flat in the periphery will work. 2% in the core and negative 2% in the periphery won't work. And then you're talking about this massive forced contraction of these economies, which puts you into the debt trap that you see at the moment, where as the economies are shrinking, the debt burden grows, there are more sell-offs. Uh, the banks try to offload their assets, which pushes the asset prices down, and you're suddenly in this negative equilibrium, economically speaking. Um, and nothing that I've seen apart from a few bits of gloss on European Council statements that have come out, suggests that the people that matter get the crisis. Um, now, Hollande, Monti, uh, and to be honest, the unsung hero of this is probably Mario Draghi, who really did keep the system going earlier this year with the three-month, um, the president of the European Central Bank, um, um, by, by providing unlimited liquidity to the European banks off of very low, low collateral. So, you know, there are people behind the scenes that seem to be prepared to accept this sort of transfer union by stealth. And there's some German economists are writing about this saying, actually, the, the, big, the big issue here isn't, the, isn't the, um, uh, the official bailout programs. It's the buildup in imbalances in the interbank payment system. Germany's on the hook for about 700 billion. And if it all goes down, that's just going to never, that, that won't be paid. Um, so there are things going on to be, that, that doesn't sound like it's a cause for optimism if you're German, maybe, but for the rest, for the system, it is something to be optimistic about because it's covering a shortfall. But the official line and the official programs just seem to me to suggest a misunderstanding of the problem. So the danger is that the markets literally take it out of the government's hands and you get a, a completely chaotic and disorderly default in Greece um, and the contagion effect of that into the, the, the Spanish and Italian sovereign and banking um, markets in terms of the market for the debt of the countries and the banks uh, becomes... Um, unsustainable and, and, and they're then faced with, with, with defaulting or leaving the Eurozone too. And at that point I think you're talking about a scenario that makes Lehman look like small potatoes. Yeah, so I'm... Scenario, but no, yeah, but... Have and the Nazis. Oh, no, 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 well... Uh, well, you can get a look at Karl, mm. for the 30s, we have nationalism, but nationalism are not taking over governments. So yeah, that there, are, there are important differences which need to be... Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm speaking back to yes, yeah. Need, these differences need to be identified mm -hmm. in order for us to get them real, mm -hmm. uh, and that, uh, as realistic an analysis as possible, yeah. so that we can be more moral. Can I yeah. reply to that point? 
Yeah, so uh, yeah, we don't have the exact same type of nationalism. We still have the same type of challenge that that nationalism that Kat talked about uh, uh, described. So so it's it's uh, the same socialist nation that we're facing, and and uh, politicians that are accountable to their own nation. And there is a slight rise of na nationalism, and actually the the, the far right is, is doing pretty well in 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 uh, across Europe. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't think we, uh, yeah. yeah. No. Yes, yes, it's, it's not similar. The, the, the second point, the second point I would make to, I would, I would like to make is a theoretical one that, that uh, we're not uh, saying that, that uh, the, the crisis, this crisis is of the same magnitude as, as the one described by Carr. Uh, and uh, we're not looking to him for a blueprint uh, for, for a crisis solving. Uh, in that we're following his own his own ideas about uh, about history. So when when you look backward, you don't look for solutions. You you look for uh, critical insights, and that's what we're doing, uh, trying to do here. Uh, we're trying to, to find uh, because he uh, can't develop the theory of crisis, uh, even even if it's implicit. So uh, crisis, in a sense, becomes the agent of change. So uh, what are th those key elements that? that uh, are uh, the requirements for a crisis to occur and, and uh, actually how political actors behave uh, in face of that crisis will determine uh, the outcome. If, if, they f if they fail to realize the situation, then the outcome will be much worse, a collapse of the system, than, than it would be. I mean, just very quickly, just very quickly, just to yeah. bookend this. I mean, I, 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 obviously I, I, I agree with you. I'm not suggesting, in the sense that I'm not suggesting there's some sort of carbon copy situation now that we can read off the, obviously, obviously not. Uh, and even if some incredibly right-wing fascist government did take power in Greece, it's not Germany, we can take them. So, I mean, it's, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a completely different dynamic. But, important point, but, 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 we could have had this conversation in 1930, 1931, and I could have been sitting here saying, you know, actually what happens in six or seven years if we don't deal with this problem is something as colossal as World War II, and somebody would say the same thing, that's just a scenario. Yes, countries leaving the Euro, Greece defaulting, in, literally in a chaotic scenario over a weekend, is just a scenario, but those that that would have been a scenario back in 1931 too. And if what Carr is 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 saying is that you have these points when a crisis is developing and you can behave prudently and responsibly and try and manage it, or you cannot, then we're back in that situation of the decision point where actually what happens over the next five or six years um, will be very much affected by decisions now in the same way that it was in 1931. So the dynamics are the same, but the facts obviously very different. The specifics are different. Look, yeah. okay. actually, just thinking about that here, though I agree with Richard, you know, there's major differences in work. You could actually argue that, uh, I'm just remembering that, that um, the uh, financial crisis, particularly the financial crisis in Eastern Europe, uh, was solved by 33. The economic crisis was over. Uh, so there is, if I see your two, uh, your Venn diagram, mm -hmm. you could say the economic crisis is a very small uh, circle, and the, the, the political crisis that follows is much bigger. We haven't hit that. Yeah. But uh, anyway, yeah. um, that's not, um, not actually what I wanted to talk about. But I was thinking about your, your, your use of car, and um, I know that there's a kind of a, an irony here in applying car's policy, I think. Is, um, and I think, you know, Costa sort of answered this in a way when he was talking about how you were using car. Because uh, the problem is that you, you, you read car, and, and you are seduced by, uh, by what, what is a, a, a wonderful argument and thought exercise. Um, any problem, of course, is that Carr was trying to be policy relevant uh, much of the time. And the problem was, was that he consistently got it wrong. Uh, I mean, he was largely wrong about the side. He was wrong about the have-have-not stuff. He was wrong about what Chamberlain was trying to do. With the minor errors. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> minor errors. Uh, very important. He was wrong about British foreign policy. He was, uh, <laughs> he was wrong about the public opinion. And, So there's a kind of a, a, an irony here, I think, that in sort of a fine car, you'll find, you'll find someone who was a bit of a public policy failure in some respects, even though, I mean, he was, a, he was an excellent writer, and, uh, um, and, and I do admire him a lot. Um, just also, I suppose, related to that is, uh, I was thinking while you were presenting car, that of course there's a, a similar family-related argument in, in, uh, in Nibor's, particularly in um, uh, a moral man in moral society about the role of, of authority and legitimacy, which might also you could apply, I think, to this to this crisis as well. Uh, um, although Nigel sort of takes, in some respects, uh, um, a bit more of a kind of um, uh, a labour relations line that might be more even more relevant to the case. And I suppose finally, 
facetiously tongue-in-cheek uh, and in a, uh, uh, a, a room full of classical realists, because uh, one thing I can throw out is, if you're going to discuss this, why, why go for Carr when you can go for people who are living at the same time, go for Pollyanna and Blanchard to, to, to explain this? Do they do it better uh, in terms mm. of Pollyanna's analysis and the great transformation, which is also a piece of international theory? Mm. Uh, and uh, and, and Gramsci's notion of Germany. Do they actually get better at the explanation here than, than Carr's more, more kind of. Um, uh, I'll leave it at that, but Carr's mm -hmm. analysis. We might um, take Bill's as well, Bill's question. I have two great presentations. One little thing to follow about Carr, first of all. And I think your reading is right on the mark in terms of when moralism becomes a term for lawyers now, which is critical. And that's perfect. But I also think, in the spirit of your comment this morning, that may have to do with my linguistic because the critique of moralism is clearly there before. I think that you know, the stuff you worked on, which you know so well from the 30s, I mean, that's about a critique of a certain kind of neo-Kantian distinction between is and ought, right? Um, and one of the implications of that clearly is that the ought uh, should have something to do with the is, what's happening in society or power. So I, you know, I think that is a, a strand that's always there. And you're right, it doesn't really get articulated. So that's just a, a very small thing. Um, Daniel, I thought it was fantastic. The only thing that struck me is, um, I guess I was surprised a little bit by this. I mean, maybe I'm just very naive uh, about this, but you could, one could have more bluntly made a more radical argument coming from Carr. And maybe I'm just reinterpreting what they're saying. But Carr, I mean, in those constructive writings in the 40s about what should happen in Europe, you didn't talk too much about the details of those writings. I mean, those are openly socialistic, you know? And um, I read those as saying, basically, um, World War, has, it's a, this is a crisis. We've been living through this horrific crisis of economic liberalism. Um, the only answer to this ultimately is a new social order, a new society, he calls it, right? Mm -hmm. So, in other words, if you want to have, we need to have a supranational political organization. That is not consistent with economic liberalism. Or any other. And that could be the basis for a very fundamental critique of a lot of aspects of the EU. Therefore, if you're serious about European integration, we have to talk about it in terms of social. Carl thought that the crisis, his crisis, provided us with an opening for that. Mm. The, war, the war provided us with a chance for a radical social economic transformation. He was excited for a moment because he thought all the way from Moscow to the New Deal, there was a consensus about the need for that. You know? um, so I mean, one can tell a story there. I mean, unfortunately, the story is also one that's not politically workable today, probably, right? But that would be a way to go um, a bit different from what, you know. So yes, power, morality, and compromise, but I think he was, in his socialist spirit of the time, he would say that that means something much more specific. We need to have, we, we can have economic liberalism ultimately in Europe. Why? Because it's political, we're seeing that now. I mean, this is, I, I think he's right about this. We're seeing how ultimately it's politically and socially dis dis disintegrated in all sorts of ways. But it takes obviously different forms mm. what he was looking at. So that would be, maybe, maybe that's what you're saying, that you're just being more nuanced about it than I am. I'm just ranting and raving very much. <laughs> okay, answers. No, yes. We have loads of questions. Do you want to answer yours first? You can see. Mine's really short. Yeah. So, so go. All right. Answers. Thanks. Oliver. First. Thanks, Bill, for for that. I mean, I I agree with you that the idea was there behind it. For me, it was as you said, it's just it's just the articulation that I also find interesting. And I, I follow um, Chuklara in this. Um, in her legalism book, she makes this I think quite nicely. She portrays the way the same dynamics of argument that were used that law used to decouple itself from morality, political realists then, a la Morgenthau, used to decouple themselves from both. Um, and that is an articulation that only happens round about then. Um, and so for me, the counterfactual is, well, had Morgenthau and co. not come up with that kind of articulation, would you have had the same impact also on not just foreign policy circles, but also on the way IR as a field of study distance itself from normative theory. Um, and again, I see we don't know, but, but for me it's, it's quite striking that maybe people wouldn't have caught on in the way that they did to this kind of, just had it not been for that kind of vocabulary. Um, because which I think is quite powerful, even though it can be used in all kinds of wrong and strange ways. But it's, it's something I think people could do something with, which goes back to what we were saying this morning. Um, you know, what is the kind of, I think Morgenthau was very conscious of his surroundings and always wanted to make sure that he could resonate with his audience. And I think moralism is, is clearly one that he could do that with. Okay. Okay, uh, if I go, uh, my, my, okay. Yeah, sure. 
So uh, to the points raised by, by Luke, yeah, you're right, he, he got most things wrong uh, when, when it came to, prescri uh, to prescriptions specifically. So he, he got the Soviet, Soviet Union wrong too. Nationalism. Uh, nationalism. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he got also the fate of nationalism wrong. Um, so, uh, w well, his uh, biographer, Haslam, made a very good point that he was always eager to, to diagnose and uh, perhaps too eager to prescribe. Uh, I think his di diagnosis wasn't, wasn't necessarily bad. The fact that he was a, uh, a not very successful uh, policy maker uh, or uh, opinion maker did, did, didn't make necessarily the diagnosis wrong. Another thing is that uh, if, if, you, if you read some, some of the more prescriptive uh, works, like, like the Conditions of Peace or Nationalism and After, you will see that, uh, okay, what he prescribed didn't happen, social planning didn't happen, uh, the balance between nationalism and nationalism didn't happen, so nationalism didn't fade away. But those things that, that, that he posed as conditions for resolving uh, the, the crisis uh, of nationalism, of self-determination, for instance, are still unanswered, and the, they lie at the heart of, of, of the problem that, that uh, say, Europe faces today. Uh, but, uh, yeah, as, as I mentioned in the previous question, uh, we're looking mainly for the critical insights rather than the prescription from Karl. Uh, the, the main thing is, is uh, the balance between power and morality. Uh, well, I should say here that I totally agree with the, po uh, the point raised by Will. Be, uh, that, that uh, yes, he, he had a very strong socialist aspect, but it was more trendy back then. Uh, in the 30s and 40s, it was uh, much more uh, acceptable in the West to, to discuss about planning. Uh, I, I do agree that, that the, at least his critique of, of uh, laissez-faire liberalism is quite strong and is, is still valid. Uh, but that's that's me. You might you might have a different opinion. Uh, so, oh, Polanyi and Gramsci. Yeah, uh, yeah. I do not disagree that they might offer uh, useful insights on that too. Uh, we we mainly focus on Carr because he has. Uh, we think he, he he strikes a very good balance between the domestic and in the and in the international. So. Uh, his, his uh, insights can help both in, in domestic uh, policy and the formation of foreign policy, which is a balance that is quite, quite uh, useful to strike when, when you're dealing with uh, European integration issues. Dan? Yeah. No, I, on Polanyi, I, um, the more I read him, the more I agree with you, which is actually he did a lot of this stuff better. Um, I just haven't decided fully what I think about that yet. But from an economic sociology perspective, I think his stuff is brilliant. I mean, just the, one of the core ideas, the concept of embeddedness, and what you can do with that concept um, in terms of looking at an economic sociology of this crisis. There's so much you could do with it. I just haven't thought it through yet. Um, but I'm increasingly starting to agree with this point that Carr um, was less original than perhaps we, we think he was. But, um, you know, maybe you don't agree with that and we have dissent in, 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 the, in, in, our, in our paper. But that's, we that's good. We balance, can, yeah, yeah, we strike a balance between something and something. Um, on, the, on the point about maybe taking Carr and, and coming up with, uh, pushing for a more radical, um, not answer, but a more radical outline of a future Europe. I'm not a very radical person. I mean, look at the way I dress, right? But I'm not a very radical person. But... Um, if the task in conditions of peace was, as he said, to, to you know, once the, I'm going to paraphrase him, but I'm going to do it terribly because I'm not good at remembering quotes, but he said, you know, once we've used realism to dismantle the current utopia and there's nothing left, the task of building the new utopia must begin that will then once again fall to the tools of realism. He's something like that. He said something like that. And maybe, yeah, maybe we're in the stage now that the, the utopia that was the, the you know, the, the utopian construct that was was the eurozone. Let's say it was built on somewhat idealistic grounds, and now the task is to use the crisis as an opportunity to move forward to something really quite radical. Now, quite radical to me could could be could be a European Union budget that's 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 fifteen percent of you know of of of, 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 um, of eurozone GDP, for instance. I mean, that doesn't sound like something you'd put on a bumper sticker. Um, but, but it would be politically incredibly um, radical, but I still don't think, I just can't see the prospect of it happening. I mean, uh, again, uh, uh, there's been a lot of economic papers that have come out over the last couple of years saying, 
You know, the reason why uh, states in America, for instance, can get, through, can get through crises and manage these imbalances is because so many of their entitlements are paid from Washington. And if we actually had a huge pot of money in Brussels that was basically performing the automatic stabilizer role in the economy, then a lot of this would be mitigated. But it's a huge, I mean, the gap from where we are now to that is, is just colossal. And maybe I'm not radical enough to think it could ever happen or not radical enough to think it through, but. Maybe it should, I mean, I just like to it's easy for me to say sometimes I'm from another part of the world. Mm. Maybe it should then be the job of the, whatever you want to call it, the critical intellectual to make the argument, the Karian argument for mm -hmm. some sort of unified social democratic world. Yeah. I mean, instead of, I mean, because I, I, I keep hearing these arguments that move in that direction, mm. and they're often made by people who are sparing at the same time, which is understandable, except politically it seems like that's, you know, one has to sort of say, okay, this is yeah. where we have to move. But keep it if you're going to lose. Yeah. yeah. I think I think you might you you you, you I think you're prob possibly right. I think that is certainly would be a role for a critical intellectual. But um, I mean, I think it just it just seems so implausible to get to get rid of. I mean, you know, the idea, for instance, the idea um, that what you'd have we go back to sort of functionalist theory and certainly neo-functionalist theory in, in European integration literature that you'd have this this transfer of competences and then the transference of loyalties would follow it eventually. So as the competence grows at, at the Brussels level, at the European level, loyalties of individuals will follow too and people will feel genuinely European. Now we have European Union citizenship. We can all, well not all of us because we've got an international audience, a lot of us could get before the ECJ potentially. You know, we, 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 European law applies to us as individual citizens but do we really feel like European citizens? I have never come across anybody that genuinely says that and, and means it. There, there are people but... Negatively, there is greater solidarity. Mm -hmm. We're more solidaristic yeah? mm -hmm. because we don't have the solidarity. But we now know that, whereas we didn't prior to the crisis. So, that yeah. is what is interesting, mm -hmm. and that is what will be the next move. But it is a functionalist argument mm -hmm. because that solidarity as a negative sign can't be yet politicized. Okay. I wonder whether these are important. I mean, uh, I'm going to shut up. I want to take all the rest of the questions. We've yeah, got sorry. Baker, we've got Jan, we've got Hartman, we've got Basket, we've got Mike. Sure. So, and we've got Camilla, too. And we're very nearly finished. Yeah, well, so we five oh, no, we'll just take the questions and then you give us food for thought for the future. Okay, so with Baker, you were first. Yeah, okay. I've got a question then. Um, I don't quite understand why you talk about a compromise between power and morality. entirely framed within your diagnosis of the crisis. There's an economic crisis and there's a crisis of retail. Germany does not understand its own self-interest. It doesn't understand that it's in, in its self-interest to accommodate. Mm -hmm. And your, what underpins the virtues of prudence and responsibility and moderation is the capacity to understand that it's in your self-interest to be all of those things. But is that morality? Or is there something more to morality? That somehow has to sustain this. This is very much sort of linked to what uh, Sean talked about in, in the morning. Is there a deeper crisis than just Germany not being very wise, being too clean, pursuing itself, or what do you mean by morality? And then we have Hartmut. Yeah, I can make very brief, short <coughs> idea to your question, and then uh, I think what uh, you were wondering is when is moralism coming in as a terminology into a phenomenon that may have to do with this immigration when you engage. Then, and, and Costas, you probably won't like this because you already defended your use of power. <laughs> but I was just thinking to take your problematic theories. Uh, I kind of see here, uh, particularly because you don't seem not to like the German position, which is perfectly fine, uh, a kind of neo colonial or post colonial problematic here. So, linking back to what Matilda uh, taking Gramsci or Polanyi, if you take some kind of colonial or post colonial literature, I think there is much more to the point here than maybe kind of using or trying or thinking how to deal with power and kind of banding in here and there. This is, according to my understanding, the problematic which we had in Europe, the problem of perpetual, and we're very 
very many neoprisome and postprisome procedures uh, can, can be observed in this world. And maybe, just analytically speaking, taking your problematic apart and taking it serious, something which is more fruitful, I would think, than bending hard and beating it into shape kind of what fits your analytical problem. Okay, go very quickly, you got Jan and Mike. I have a question for Daniel and Costas, which is very similar. I mean, you framed it as a cognitive problem, basically, and that seems to me is perhaps an impoverished reading of the, of the issue. And I wonder also whether your analysis would be sharp if you look a little bit outside the Eurozone, but still on the countries that are in the EU, and that is Britain, or the nutcase who sits in Prague as a president, right? I mean, these people actually were not to live from this development. Michael. I'm just curious if Carl was an Englishman and wrote in his perspective of the British national interest. What would the British national interest be? Camilla and then Bastard. Um, say, I'd like to ask uh, also, I wonder whether you can, um, do you defend your position against the, your uh, more philosophers' colleagues as basically? The final word of us. Yes, this might sound like a strange question coming from a Greek. Who's um, on the receiving end of the, the coin? But I was wondering um, whether we can learn also, if we accept the basis of your argument about Karl, uh, whether we can learn also from Karl's failures uh, in the in the twenty years crisis. One of the failures, some claim that one of the failures of the book is that he uh, failed on appeasement exactly because he failed to appreciate the nature of the Nazi state and the nature of the Nazi phenomenon in general, and Nazi extremity and Nazi, and Nazi aggressiveness. So I was wondering, um, will the problem be solved if Germany makes all these concessions, uh, you know, allows conflation, or will it fail anyway because there is a misunderstanding of the nature of the Greek situation and the specific and the locality of the Greek situation and the nature of the Greek state and the nature of the Greek political system. That, in other words, what is the responsibility of the hard law?